Greetings, I'm Dr. Carrie Rote. I'm a professor at A&M Corpus Christi, and I am going to be talking to you today about um, three trips I made to Oaxaca uh, to visit for the Day of the Dead. Um, this is my presentation, A Grave Affair. Um, I was, had the opportunity to make three trips to the Day of the Dead. The first one was in 2001, and the second in 2003, and the last trip was in 2009. And my opportunities um, to go to Oaxaca actually started in 1978, when I went on my first trip to Oaxaca with uh, Professor Dr. Robert Mullen, uh, who was at the University of Texas at San Antonio. He took a group of students to Oaxaca to look at the colonial monuments there, and I just fell in love with Oaxaca and ended up uh, writing my dissertation on the ancient funerary art of Monte Alban and um, other Zapotec sites. Um, for Day of the Dead, my research focused on the city of Oaxaca, which is located in the central area of the state of Oaxaca, in the Valley of Oaxaca. So that name you'll hear quite a bit. Um, when I go on trips to Oaxaca, I don't limit myself to looking at art just in the area of the city. Uh, one of the sites uh, that we visit is Monte Alban, uh, which I will talk about uh, shortly. At the foot of Monte Alban is the town of Hohokotlan, uh, which you can see right here. And Hohokotlan is actually built on part of the city uh, that was Monte Alban. Uh, Monte Alban itself is on a hill. And the city Hoho is down um, below that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about Hoho as we go along because that was the focus of our research uh, for Day of the Dead. Uh, we also traveled to Quilapan, Zachila, Yagu, Lambetieco, Mitla, Hierve el Agua, and then up on the superhighway to. Mexico City, um, in that third arm of the valley, uh, we visited Cuishlawaka. Unfortunately, we're going to talk about Day of the Dead, so I won't be able to talk too much about these other places that we went. Um, that'll be something for another time. Oaxaca is a city that is uh, very ancient. Um, it is a city that combines that past of the Zapotecs and the Mixtecs, the two people who were living in the Valley of Oaxaca. And um, then it has a strong colonial presence as well. And then on top of that is the modern. My 2001 and 2003 trips were, um, we stayed at the Holiday Inn and this is a picture from the rooftop of the Holiday Inn. Uh, I believe Barbara Riley, uh, my colleague, took this photo. So I have a blending in here of photos from 2001 and 2003 uh, that were made by Barbara. And then I have some photos included from 2009, which I was the one who took those particular photos. As I mentioned, um, one of the most important sites for the pre-Columbian time period was the city of Montalban. This was the capital of the Zapotec culture during their classic period, which ended around 600 to 700 AD. This part of Montalban was built on top of the main plaza area, was built on top of a mountain and actually was very overgrown by the time that the Spaniards arrived. So they were never able to exploit it. It wasn't until 1930 that Alfonso Caso was sent by the Mexican government uh, to start excavations here. 
In his first year or season of excavation, he found gold in one of the tombs, and he was granted um, an additional 17 seasons to work um, at this particular site. Um, archaeological work continues in the Valley of Oaxaca, uh, even to today. Um, so, but this was a very important discovery that was made. Um, as I mentioned in that first um, exploration where Caso found the gold, um, they also found some other amazing artifacts in Tomb 7. Um, the way that tombs were utilized um, in Oaxaca in the pre-Columbian time period is they were familial tombs that were used uh, generation after generation. So this tomb, actually number seven that he found, um, contained remains of a Mishtek burial, which was from a later date. So um, this is a Mishtek artifact, which is a actual human head that has been removed um, from the tomb, extracted, um, and then decorated with uh, shells for the eyes, uh, for the nose, um, the actual teeth are here. And then with rabbit's glue, they adhered these beautiful turquoise mosaics all over the head. Uh, they extracted um, different bones from the deceased, and then they would rearrange them, and then they would put the next generation into the tomb Sometimes they would take the femur out and use it to reflect that they were the true descendant of their ancestor. Now that would be particularly if you were royalty. Uh, and we also see that there is a tremendous veneration of ancestors. And we can see that in this old man funerary urn. If you look closely, you can see he's missing a lot of his front teeth. Uh, his face is very wrinkled. He is uh, presenting an offering. Uh, and um, these are very popular throughout Oaxaca. This is a typical type of urn that we find there, which represents different individuals. And the second layer of history in Oaxaca, of course, is the colonial. And there are a huge number of magnificent churches in Oaxaca and surrounding regions. Uh, this is the Church of Santo Domingo, which is a colonial masterpiece. And through this portal on the side, which was a convent, um, it is now a museum, a Museo Regional de Oaxaca. They also have a huge botanical garden and uh, libraries that are housed here. And um, when you go into the church, uh, you see the tremendous beauty of the colonial past, um, the beautiful decorations and everything is gilded. Um, it's just kind of an astounding place uh, to visit. Uh, just with all the glory of the decorations and the marvelous gold glittering all the time. We also were uh, very uh, surprised and excited uh, one year to see these projections that were put up against the side of the Museo Regional entrance. Um, this is showing us a, uh, the god of the dead, Miquelantecutli, uh, from an ancient Aztec image. Uh, so they are kind of showing us origins of the celebration. Our first trip in 2001, um, and actually I kind of spearheaded these uh, expeditions because I had been to Oaxaca so many times before, and I had a good friend there, uh, Dr. Marcus Winter and his wife Cecily, um, who, uh, Mark is an archaeologist, um, now retired uh, from the INA, uh, who did a lot of excavations in Oaxaca. 
uh, one of his assistants, Juan Cruz, was an artist who actually drew pictures of the archaeological ruins, uh, different objects that were found in the archaeological excavations. So even though we have photography, we still have artists who do that traditional type of drawing. Juan Cruz uh, came with us uh, for the weeks uh, in 2001 and 2003 that we were there in Oaxaca. And he, allowed, he told us about the traditions and took us around to see the different aspects of the holiday. This is my research team, uh, Pam Meyer, who is seated uh, on the ground talking to Juan, holding the recorder up. Uh, Paula Biedenhorn, who is next to me. And then on the other side of me is Barbara Riley. Um, I'm the only professor still teaching. Both Pam Meyer and Barbara Riley um, have retired from A&M Corpus Christi. And Paula Biedenhorn uh, went on to Aurora College. Uh, but unfortunately, um, she is no longer with us. She died uh, very young. Um, so this is good that I have these pictures of Paula. Um, we also here is showing you a close-up of Dr. Meyer uh, interviewing Juan, who is uh, telling us in English, um, which he was very well spoken in English, um, about the holiday. Um, in 2009, I took a group um, back to Day of the Dead and um, this is part of my group, uh, but a very adventurous group of friends who were interested in knowing more about Day of the Dead. Uh, the first time we arrived in 2001, we had this little calavera or kind of homemade calavera uh, sitting on the dashboard of our taxi. And we took it as a sign that we were going to have a great trip and that we were going to learn a great deal about the Day of the Dead. Um, in our uh, trip, we decided um, to see all the different aspects of the festival. So the first thing that we did in the early part of the week uh, was to go to watch the preparations in the marketplace. When you go to the market, well actually when you just walk down the street in Oaxaca, you see all kinds of different uh, calaveras. Uh, you see balloons for the children. A Casper the Friendly Ghost is peeking up from here. A little intrusion of American cartoon culture. Uh, we also see, for example, going by the Corazon del Pueblo, uh, which is a shop for popular art of Oaxaca, uh, you have this beautiful Calavera Katrina uh, looking out over the balcony at you, inviting you to come in and purchase items in the shop. As you go into the market itself, which um, you have a picture here from one of the stalls. Uh, this is a stall where they have um, different religious icons, uh, crucifixes, rosaries, so those types of things for purchase. Um, you also go to uh, stall after stall of candles. Um, you'll see later why we need so many candles for Day of the Dead. And while we were going in our first two trips, um, we also were purchasing items like the candles uh, to help with Juan Cruz's family celebration. So we were wanting to help decorate the grave uh, with the tapetes, um, and we wanted to help uh, fund the project. Also, you have many people selling copal um, incense, which is to me very heavy and hard for me kind of to deal with. <laughs> Um, but here you can see this vendor who has the copal and then also the incensarios uh, available for purchase there. And of course the holiday would not be complete without calaveras, uh, the sugar candy skull version. 
and uh, these are individual heads uh, that are made out of uh, sugar and you have a band here where you write your name and down here I love these little amaranth seed uh, calaveras uh, down at the bottom which are actually very good for you the amaranth seed um, is uh, a food now that a lot of people are trying to eat um, some of the sugar skulls are elaborately decorated which you can see here in this one which has such almost baroque kind of decoration on the face and around the head uh, obviously a princess of some sort uh, that we are looking at. Um, in addition, you will go when you go in the market. You see uh, row, uh, bags and bags and bags, which you can kind of see here, of these heads um, in bags, and they are some are really big, like these are bigger ones. Some are really small, um, like over here on the left hand side. And these heads are sold uh, to be utilized to put in the pan de muerto. Um, so once you get the pan de muerto, you don't eat that head. You pull it out and then you eat the sweet bread itself. Um, the heads are there for decorative purposes. Um, so uh, you don't eat them. But here you go again. You can see just the beautiful color of all of these different heads. And... Ponde Muerto can be decorated in a variety of ways. Here we are looking at someone who decorated them with icing, um, putting all kinds of different figures on them. And then we look up at the top and there are the heads um, at the very top uh, that you can see. And of course, uh, Day of the Dead would not be complete without hundreds and thousands of flowers. Uh, the traditional flowers are the marigolds and coxcomb, which you can see here. Uh, but that didn't stop people from using uh, flowers of different types and colors along with uh, these particular ones. And we can see, for example, um, the marigolds here that are being brought in in loads and these loads will be easily sold uh, very quickly um, so you have a lot of workers coming in all, at all times we actually also went to the fields uh, where the flowers are uh, harvested and we um, met a couple who invited us to uh, one particular uh, parade in the city of Etla, which was very exciting to be personally invited and uh, treated to that experience. So that's the next phase of what I was going to talk about, the comparses or parades. These comparses took place uh, the every day that we were there, so they run really throughout the week. And comparses are, some are for children and some for adults. Uh, here is a young child kind of dressed more in Halloween costume. Um, we were told not to really encourage that uh, because we were Americans. Uh, we oftentimes had little kids approach us and ask us for candy because they knew that was part of the Halloween tradition. And we would tell them, uh, no es Halloween and uh, es Dia de Muertos. <laughs> And we didn't give them anything. Uh, maybe some some money, but not any candy. We were discouraging that. Um, with the comparses, you have musicians that uh, go along with them and uh, sing for the parade. And the way that the parade is done is people walk down the street, then they get to a certain spot, and they um, dance at the corner, um, well, at the intersection. They will dance and dance and dance, and then they will walk on. And when they get to the next uh, intersection, they will dance some more. Um, so you can see that here are our revelers here. 
and of course then bystanders who are not dressed up are watching the activities taking place. So you have both uh, participants and uh, watchers. Um, in the city of Etla, where we visited for the one particular parade, um, all of the actors in the parade were male, um, and they said the reason was because all the women were preparing the food for the Day of the Dead. So there were no women to uh, participate, so the men actually dressed as women and men um, and enacted the parade. So, and like I said, these took place at nighttime. They took place in the daytime. Uh, they were always happening uh, just as a part of the celebration. Um, in fact, um, here you can see them uh, walking along and bystanders kind of not just sitting there, but a lot of times walking along with the uh, parade. And here they're about to stop and to do a little dance um, in the middle of the street. And some of the parades were just for the children. So this was one of the children's parades. And when we asked the parents about why they did it, they said, well, the children are so excited at this time of the year with everything that is going on that they won't go to sleep at night. Uh, so they said they take them on these parades and uh, it really works because not only are the kids walking these long distances, but at every corner they're stopping and uh, dancing and then they're continuing on. So by the time they're done, they're beat and they go home and go to sleep. <laughs> um, and in addition to that, you have people who are there documenting. So Barbara Riley, who was with me, was documenting. We had other photographers also there documenting. We also had people taking movies, and they. this is a pair from, I believe they were from Arizona, and um, they were doing the same thing that we were, and they came up and interviewed me, I believe it was in Spanish, um, asking me what we were doing there. So I kind of gave them the, the lowdown. Uh, I don't know if I ever ended up in their video or not. Uh, I should have checked and found out. Um, the next phase of our journey was to go to the cemeteries, to the Pantiones. And um, for the Day of the Dead, um, the Pantiones are very beautifully decorated. Everybody spruces up their family graves and decorates them with flowers, um, which adds just this beautiful burst of color. And it's nice to go to the cemeteries in the daytime and then also at the night so that you can uh, see the difference in quality between the two. Um, family members gather at their family graves and they sit around and they put food and drink on top of the grave. Um, they sit on graves and visit and laugh and uh, they share, so they were very kind. A lot of people shared food with us, some of which we weren't really sure what we were eating, uh, but had to be polite and eat whatever was presented to us. Uh, this is another view of the cemeteries. And like I said, people are very friendly and happy. They're enjoying the time because they know at this time their ancestors, their uh, relatives will come back to them uh, in the nighttime. And this is showing um, the evening, uh, the candles all around. Uh, so this is why we had a lot of candles uh, to allow people to stay for the nighttime when the souls of the departed come back. So on November 1st, the souls of the children come back. And they come in with a cold wind in the nighttime. And on November 2nd, the souls of the adults uh, come in at nighttime. Um, some of the people that are in the uh, cemetery celebrating 
are there for uh, what I consider kind of tragic deaths. So this is a group of young men who lost their buddy, uh, his bicycle, they bring it with them uh, so that they can uh, celebrate his life. Um, he was killed as a young man and so they're sitting at his grave drinking. Um, they invited us to join them or to have a drink. I think we declined on this one, but anyway, everybody's very friendly and wanting uh, every uh, wanting people to join and celebrate with them. It's not a negative feeling, it's a positive feeling of celebration. Well, in, during the Days of the Dead, um, you also go from house to house. So when we went to Hokotlan with uh, Juan, um, he took us through the different houses of his neighbors and friends, and they pretty much just accept anybody into um, their houses during this. It's like open house all the time. And uh, the main thing that you serve uh, to your guest is chocolate, uh, which we can see that she is making here uh, in this particular image. And then also pan de muerto to go along with it. And if you go to enough houses, you're going to be pretty stuffed by the end of the day, uh, evening, because you're going to have to eat all of this different food to be polite. Um, so it can be a lot. Um, we also went to the undertaker's home, uh, which we can see here. And um, she had Elvis and Marilyn uh, at her house. And we actually interviewed her about um, how she prepared the dead and she really was shocked she said you really want to know that and we go yes we really do and you can see the cakes which she served us here um, in this particular This is a view of Juan Cruz's uh, family's home, uh, just the wall in the living area, uh, where they invited us and we had dinner uh, as part of the Day of the Dead festival. Uh, when you go to Oaxaca, like I said, for the festival, uh, just like any festival, you have a real emphasis on food. Uh, the food in Oaxaca is absolutely magnificent. Um, this is just showing you a dinner plate uh, from one of the restaurants uh, there. Uh, they have their own unique cuisine, which is, like I said, wonderful. And every restaurant you go to or home, you will have decorations uh, for Day of the Dead. So here's our little calavera buddy um, at one of our restaurants. Um, the main place where we went in 2001 was to the home of Juan, Juan Cruz. And this is Juan's family who very graciously invited us into their home and allowed us to have the dinner with them for the Day of the Dead. Um, here are his family members cooking, uh, making food for us um, over a fire. Um, and they had prepared for days. So it's not just like they made the meal that day, but for days they had been working on the food which they presented to us. Um, this was one dish which we had, which is called the pletamal. It is an ancient Aztec dish, and this was the first time I'd ever had it. Uh, it is absolutely delicious. It's uh, has avocado leaves in it and um, I have actually recently found some recipes online for it. it back in the day I couldn't find them but now there are some recipes that are available so maybe one day I'll be able to make pletamal myself um, and then Oaxaca is very famous for their mole so another dish that you eat for Day of the Dead is the mole and it can be very spicy so um, and the homemade tortillas on the table. One family member just made tortillas uh, all the time. That was her main job. Then in addition, people make altars either for their homes, 
Um, they're also um, in businesses. So wherever you go, you will see an altar for the Day of the Dead. This was the altar in the Cultural Center in Oaxaca, um, which is magnificent in its appearance with a kind of colonial painting in the center. Um, we went to the bank to get money and we found this beautiful uh, altar there. Um, even with uh, the flower petals uh, leading from the doorway to the altar so we would know where to go. Um, the hotel, the Holiday Inn where we stayed, had a beautiful altar. Um, and of course on the altar you put different things that your loved ones would have enjoyed in life uh, to take them on their journey because they're coming on a journey from the afterlife and then they're returning uh, back to heaven. So they're coming to be with you. Um, so you need water every time you go on a journey. Um, this was a particular drink that Juan's father enjoyed, so we purchased that bottle. And uh, you have nuts and fruit, pan de muerto, pletamal, mole. You put a little bit of everything that you're eating onto the altar um, and donate it and give it as a, kind of an offering to the deceased. Um, in the 2009, the hotel that we were staying in had, uh, which was right on the plaza, um, had made an altar dedicated to uh, the founder of the hotel who had recently died. Uh, so this was the altar when we came in. And you're allowed to add things to the altar. Uh, you can see that he had a tamale, um, some uh, maybe some milk or something of that type, fruit, and then I stuck on there um, a picture of my stepfather who had died recently. Um, my son had made this picture of him as a calavera uh, that we can see um, that I just, like I said, inserted it and they left it there. They let me leave that image or representation there. So um, the last aspect that was really fascinating about Day of the Dead were the tapetes or sand paintings that are made for the graves. Sand paintings or tapetes are also made at the time of a person's death and they will be placed on top of the grave for a period of days. Uh, we can see that uh, the same thing happens um, for the Day of the Dead, you'll go back and decorate the grave of your loved one, but the gray, the tapete is washed away or scraped away after the end of the festival. So it is a temporary ephemeral art form uh, that they labor over and spend a great deal of time making, but then just actually discard at the end of the time. This one is on a sidewalk in Hokohokotlan. Uh, the first year when we went in 2001, Juan Cruz said that a lot of the tradition of tapete making had been dying out. So when we ba went back in 2003, and then when I went back in 2009, uh, we noticed that there were more people making tapetes. And actually Juan himself had trained some young people on how to make tapetes. So that was uh, part of his desire was to pass this down to young men who maybe wouldn't have been interested in the process of making those, these tapetes. And for the church of Hoho, um, they would have decorations. You can see how festive the church looks and then they would make tapetes here at the altar. Uh, my impression was it was kind of a competition about who would get the honor of making the tapetes in the church and maybe kind of older members of the community that were more established. So here is Juan talking with the gentlemen who were making the tapetes for the church and here we can see one of them who is working away at his uh, beautiful tapete. 
uh, Juan himself as a Tepete artist, uh, we invited him to Corpus Christi uh, to come and make a Tepete for us. Uh, he was very excited. Uh, he always had wanted to come to the U.S. And this is actually a picture of him. Uh, we took him to San Antonio as well. Um, so here he is in San Antonio beaming uh, on the river walk that he is here with us and able to make a tapete in the United States, which was a dream of his to come here. Uh, this is showing one of uh, Juanito's tapetes. Uh, this is over the grave of his father. Uh, you can see his mother is kneeling down over on the left. Uh, this is at the end of the tapete making, and she is adding additional candles um, to his grave. Um, you can see her here lighting the candles uh, so that people can wander around the grave and see uh, the tapete. And I also um, got involved in the decoration, uh, not so much in the, the tapete itself, but in adding the flowers and those other elements because Juan had spent most of the daytime uh, working on the tapete and we were exploring Oaxaca uh, while he was doing that. But at night we could come in and help. Uh, some of them are simpler. So this is kind of a tapete for Georgina, uh, really made more out of flowers, uh, a little bit of sand for the calavera. Uh, which is at the top and the flowers around the calavera. Um, also in Oaxaca, you find different displays in different years of tapetes uh, that change. And so in one year, uh, we saw this tapete. So this is made out of sand, but it is not a flat tapete on the ground. It is a tree of death instead of a tree of life. Um, which is made uh, completely out of sand, uh, the skeletons and the skulls and the branches. And then I love the way they added the marigolds in there uh, to make it a little bit more festive in character. And uh, at the Cathedral of Oaxaca, every year that I've been there, uh, they make these giant tapetes uh, for an artist named Rodolfo Morales. Rodolfo Morales was a very prolific artist in Oaxaca who was internationally known and uh, was very beloved in Oaxaca. So after the, his death, um, they began to make uh, sand paintings in front of the cathedral that look like his painting, so it has images from his artwork. And here we can see skeletons uh, coming up out of the earth. It's like that tree of death, the fact that we have these three-dimensional forms that are emerging. So you can see the bricks around it, which are the bricks that contain the sand, and then the sculptural forms up above that even. So here you can see uh, people walking around and admiring uh, these beautiful creations. And it seemed every year that I went that they made more and more elaborate and more and more spaces covered with these tapetes, uh, all going spreading out towards the Zocalo, as you can see here. Um, and sometimes with the very brilliant colors that uh, Morales used in his paintings, such as this one you can see with the Calavera dog. And like I said, it just seemed like it went on forever. Um, and I can't even imagine how many weeks were involved in making these tremendous creations. And we even have the Calavera artist who is painting the church that we see here. Maybe Morales himself uh, from heaven painting. And uh, as I mentioned, we brought Juan to Corpus Christi 
And this is in the Center for the Arts at a Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. And Juanito came and made a traditional tapete for us. You can see the size of it. It was quite large. Uh, one of my students is there assisting him with the making of the tapete. Um, and other students are sitting there watching the event. Um, he brought his own materials with him. He is there working with one of the stencils that he brought, um, which were handed down to him from his uncle. And he also brought his own colors, which are here. And when we were working on it, I asked Juan, Juan, I said, Juan, would you like me to bring you some lunch from the cafeteria? And he said, oh, no, 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 uh, we can't eat while we were doing this. You see, we have to bend down to make it, so we can't uh, get any food in our stomachs. Um, and also, um, it's kind of a spiritual thing, we don't eat while we're making a tapete. So, um, nobody ate. We all just worked all day and helped uh, Juan with his uh, creation. And this is just a close-up view of the head of the Virgin and the beautiful uh, pink roses that we put in. So we went and got real flowers to put into with the tapete. And these, these are his stencils that he used for tapete making. So he um, had this as in his home in Oaxaca. He brought some of these very fragile paper, very thin paper stencils with him to Corpus. And here are his uh, black colors, which the black looks like velvet, the way that he mixed it together. But he had bags of every color um, that he was using. And that was our final work. But the sad thing about tapetes is, the tapetes is they're ephemeral. You can't leave them forever. We were told by Juanito that we could leave them for this tapete in place for three days, but the, at the end of three days, we had to destroy it. So at the end of that three days, my colleague Paula and I uh, went and picked it up, the plastic that was underneath, um, and picked it up and threw it in a trash can and said, we are honoring you, Juan, with the removal of this tapete. It was very hard and very sad because look how beautiful it is. And that shimmering black background that, like I said, looks like velvet in the way that it is so rich in color. One of our trips, uh, we went to Monte Alban and they had an altar to some of the archaeologists who had uh, worked there uh, at, to help to excavate Monte Alban. And um, we took a group of young kids from the local school in Hohokotlan with us. And Juanito explained to them about their culture. Um, and here you can see me with Juan as he describes and discusses the cultural background with these young children who are very fascinated by their ancestry. And it was a great moment to be there with the children. Well, I'm sorry to say there's much more I could tell you, but it's time to leave Oaxaca and to say goodbye and to get back on the road home and uh, like I said have Oaxaca in the rearview mirror here is my second group that went with me in 2009 and they are uh, relaxing on the bus from San Antonio back to Corpus so thank you all very much uh, for being here um, I enjoy talking about uh, the, my excursions to Oaxaca very much, and I hope you enjoyed them as well.